Well, last week we spent a good deal of time answering the question, what, did the, what does a disciple of Jesus Christ look like? Uh, and we did so with the assumption that followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, should stand out in the world. We don't look like other people. We should stand out in the world like light stands out in a dark room. But I want to continue on that theme this week. And I'd like to, to key in on the nature of a disciple's devotion with the assumption that we should be able to identify followers of Jesus Christ based on those things to which they are devoted, okay? We should be able to identify Christians based on the things that we see them showing a devotion towards. Would you agree with that in theory, okay? Okay, two of you, that's okay, well. <laughs> Let's look at the concept of devotion first. Uh, interesting, I, one of the, you know, whenever I prepare sermons, I uh, try to go to the original languages and see what kind of help is there. And I, I, I was playing with the word devotion. I was playing with the word commitment. And uh, you look up Greek words for devotion. You look up Greek words for uh, commitment. And they're there, but very rarely are they used in the scriptures. There's a lot of, uh, word, if you were going to use the Greek word out on the streets, uh, in Koine Greek, in the world at that time that spoke Koine Greek, you would hear the word used a lot, but not so much those words, uh, Greek words used for them in the Greek New Testament. Uh, uh, did the culture, does that mean the culture really didn't have a word used to communicate that concept? Uh, that was used in the, in the New Testament. And actually, there is a word that was used commonly in the culture and commonly in the, in the Greek New Testament. And that word is called pistis, okay, P-I-S-T-I-S. -S. Uh, but it's hardly ever translated devotion or commitment in the New Testament. Uh, it was used to convey both uh, in, in the secular world what we would expect it to convey, loyalty, obedience, commitment, trustworthiness to someone or some things. Uh, it was used with that sense that we use of we're gonna stick with this person or we're gonna stick with this thing to the very end. We're not going to give up on it. We're gonna be devoted to it. We're gonna be committed to it. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we're just, it, that's the way we're going to respond to whatever this is thing. Now, pistis is used in the Greek New Testament 243 times, okay? But when they translate it, it's translated with the word faith or some version of the word faith. Faithfulness, okay? Devotion, faithfulness, commitment, faithfulness to something. Now, this should kind of enrich in our understanding of saving faith. Being faithful doesn't just mean to keep on believing, okay? But it also means to stay loyal to with one's actions. Uh, in other words, I can say that I am a man of faith in Jesus Christ, in God through Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and I can even believe in that Christ is everything who he said he did everything he said he did, was everything he said he was, uh, but there's more to it than that. If I place my faith in him with the richness of the word, that means I need to be faithful to him, not only in what I believe, but also in what I do, you see. And it goes back to that old thing, faith without works is a dead faith. Likewise, being unfaithful didn't mean that you stopped believing, but that you broke your commitment and are no longer devoted to something you actually believe in, okay? And I identify with that because sometimes I believe in something, but my actions betray what I actually believe, but I still believe it. Does anybody else identify with that? Okay. Your faith is not only communicated in what you say, but also in what you do. Now, for instance, if we're going to look at a dis we're going to look at discipleship through this through this uh, through this uh, through the eyes of devotion, 
How many of you remember Reggie White? You remember Reggie White? Reggie White was taken home to be with the Lord a number of years ago now. Um, but Reggie played for the Packers during the latter part of his uh, more than stellar career as a professional athlete. He was a two-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year, 13-time Pro Bowler, 12-time All-Pro selection, who's, who holds the second place for among all-time career sack leaders. Anybody know who number one is? <laughs> I didn't either. Bruce Smith. Reggie had 198.5, and Bruce Smith has 200 career sacks. Anyway, Reggie was selected to the NFL 75th anniversary all-time team, the NFL 1990s all-decade team, and the NFL 1980s all-decade team. 20 years of perfect. I mean, that's unheard of to, to sustain a career in the NFL that long. He's a member of the College Pro Football Hall of Fame, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. There's little doubt about Reggie White's uh, football prowess. However, if you were to ask anybody who knew Reggie White, even a little bit during his professional career about the focus of his devotion, you think they would have told you that the focus of Reggie White's devotion was football? <laughs> no, they would not have. They would have told you about his ministry as a Christian man, an ordained evangelical minister, uh, which led to his nickname, the Minister of Defense. <laughs> Everything in his professional career as a football player he used to serve his calling as a follower of Jesus. He was a professional football player devoted to Christ. And people who knew him knew that. And he stood out. He was a light in a dark place. Now, what are you? Are you a Christian devoted to being a veter veterinarian? Or are you a veterinarian devoted to being a believer? You see? Okay. Are you a counselor devoted to be a Christian? Or a Christian devoted to be a counselor? And when people think of who you are, what do they think of? when they know you. I mean, if people don't know you, you can't hold them accountable. Are you, a, are you a Christian devoted to being a school teacher? Or a school teacher devoted to being a believer, a follower of Christ? Are you a banker devoted to being a believer or a believer devoted to being a banker? I can go all around the room. We could spend the next half hour doing this, okay? <laughs> I got everybody in the front. Let's look in the back. No. I've made a list of six things that mark f followers of Christ as devotees. The, as, as disciples, we need to be recognized by our devotion. So we have to ask ourselves, to what are we truly committed? To what are followers of Christ faithful as evidence of our calling, our number one calling, which is as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So here's the six things, and we're gonna list them off. I have six portions of scripture that I'm gonna use. Uh, and the first one, I'm gonna say, number one, disciples need to be devoted to knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord. We need to be devoted to knowing Christ as Lord. Go to Philippians chapter three. Let's look at a man who was devoted to knowing Christ as Lord and what he said. Uh, this was a difficult thing because there are so many portions of scripture I could have chosen for every one of these. And I could have made a list not of six, but probably of 80 or 100. I don't know. But these are the ones that stood out in my mind as being very critical. The kind of things that make us stand out in a world that needs to see light and needs to receive that light of God reflected off of our lives. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, we read this. Paul is talking. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Now, as I read this, think about his devotion. Think about how, how and to whom is Paul devoted. He says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, from my own obedience, from my goodness, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Not my righteousness, but God's righteousness that he gives me because I have faith in him. That righteousness. That I might know him and I might know the power of his resurrection and I might share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Followers of Christ don't simply, aren't intended simply to say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and then we just trudge through life behind him, okay? That's not what God wants of us. That's not his vision of our life in Christ with him. We're to follow him as disciples of his, learning of him. We follow him in order to learn from him. We desire to know him. We desire to know his mind. We desire to know his heart, even to the point of entering into his physical suffering. Uh, I was talking with uh, Steve Ulrich, uh, and uh, Steve and his wife recently had a little baby, and it has a cleft palate up in the back of his mouth. You can't look at the baby and tell that there's a problem, but in the back of his mouth, the soft tissue is divided. And someday Simeon is going to have to have an operation and doctors are going to pull that together. Right now, it makes it hard for him to suck. It makes it hard for him even to make noise. And they'll have to have this operation sometime before he's ready to start developing speech patterns because air doesn't flow through his mouth and through passages in a way that would allow that to happen. And I'm watching Steve holding his little boy, okay? And as he's explaining this... uh, the, this, this problem that their child has, you know, he is so engaged and he so loves this child and you can tell that he is feeling pain that his child has and is going to have. It's very hard to feed the child because he can't suck. So it, it's got to have to kind of gravity fed, has a special kind of bottle. It's hard for the child to take in enough nurture even to grow. He was so happy this week because the child gained a pound. Okay, and that was huge for the child. Uh, and I started thinking about this passage that I just preached for a service. Because Christ was born on earth, okay, and be, took on flesh so he could suffer in the human condition like we have to suffer with the human condition. He entered into our lives, okay? That is one slow fly. <laughs> I think he got into somebody's drink this morning and just flying into things. So, and, and, so, and so Christ felt, feels our pain, okay? And here we have Paul now saying, I want to enter into the pain of Christ. I want to enter into the suffering of Christ. Because the more you enter into someone else's experience and feel their pain and feel their agony, then you are going to be able, the weaker you become with them, the more likely you are to be able to feel the power of God then lift you up with them, you see. And until you can enter into someone's pain and suffering and their weakness, it's very hard to have that identity with them and know them. And what Paul wants to know is the power of the resurrection. God's power playing out in his life the way it played out in Jesus' life. And this is kind of what Steve was doing with his own little baby, entering into the experience of Simeon. Okay. And as Simeon grows, and Steve and Diana, they 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 feel what their child feels and they enter into that and they see God heal and they see God provide and they see those things. That family is going to be lifted together. Okay. We live in an age where if that, in, in, in many, many families, if that had been detected beforehand, that baby would have been aborted. Okay. That's the way it works these days. And think of what our culture misses in terms of entering into 
the life of Christ and the suffering of others because we cast people away who have problems. Think of what churches miss when they cast people out simply because they have certain sins that they don't want to deal with rather than enter into those experiences and share the power of Christ to redeem lives with them. Disciples of Christ are devoted. Devoted to knowing Jesus as Lord and entering into those things with Christ and with others. Secondly, devoted to the ministry of reconciliation. Or as we talked about when we went through the, through the Sermon on the Mount, devoted to be peacemakers. In Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, some of the portions of scripture uh, I chose might seem odd at first, but there's reason for it. Second, or Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. Uh, and here Paul is teaching the Corinthian church and he says, all of this, and he's referring to what he has written just before this, and it basically has to do with all the thing that a new, new believer receives because they are Christ's. All of this, referring to that new life in Christ, is from God, okay? You're a Christian now, we've received all of these promises from God, who, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us, then, the ministry of reconciliation. How did Christ reconcile himself to us? Well, he forgave us of our sin. Before our sins were forgiven, there was this barrier between us. Every kid who's ever grown up in a household understands this. You know, you did something wrong, mom and dad haven't found out yet. But you know they're going to find out. How do you feel? Is everything cool? Is everything at peace? Everything copacetic in the household before they find out? No, it never is, because you got this impending doom, all right? And then the day comes where they find out, and you say, yes, I did it, please forgive me, and then you wait to see what they do. And you either get, ah! or you get, ah, man, I remember when I did that. You know, I love you, I forgive you, okay, let's go on, okay? And when you get that, I love you, I forgive you, you can go on, right? And peace reigns. And they give you a hug or whatever they do in your house. I don't know. After they slap you, they hug you. I don't know. <laughs> Hello. But God wants peace with us. And he reconciled, Christ reconciled himself to us and gave us that ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says that is, in Christ, this is how it worked out, God was reconciling the whole world to himself. How did he do that? Not counting their trespasses, their sins, against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, since that message of reconcilia reconciliation has been entrusted to us, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal to the world through us. In other words, God reconciled himself to us. We understand the peace. We've received the peace of God ourselves. We've received forgiveness, and God's not done. He doesn't want just us reconciled. He wants to recon reconcile himself to the whole world. So now that we've been reconciled to him, we've now been given the task of helping the world become reconciled to God. So now we're his ambassadors. We are now his mouthpiece in this world to help them understand what God did for us. Disciples are to be devoted messengers of reconciliation. That's how disciples are made. If we can convince people that God wants to be reconciled to them so that they too can become followers of Christ, then they become disciples too. It was God's desire to be at peace with the entire world that he loved, that he created. And he made peace possible through the reconciling work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took our sins upon himself so that our trespasses would not be counted against us. He forgave us. Disciples are devoted to this message of reconciliation. This is a great message. Everybody ought to know this, right? Ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal for peace through us now. 
Now, does that seem really, really complicated? For some it might, for some it might not. Think of it this way. Let's say you go to work, or you go to school, or you go to Walmart, or you go to the dog park, wherever you're gonna go tomorrow, and you get into, into a conversation with someone who has an overwhelming sense of guilt because of bad things that they have done in their past. You ever met anybody like that? They just have, they kind of live with a sense of guilt because of things that they have done. And they believe that they've been so bad that God is angry at them. So there's this wall between them and God and God really doesn't have anything to do with them. They seem to understand that because of what they've done, that they are not at peace with God. What they've done, they believe, has become a barrier between them and God. And in a sense, it really has. Now, as God's ambassador, what does he want you to tell them? See how that works? He shared it with you. He forgave you. What do they need to know? They need to know that God will forgive them. You're his ambassador. Tell them. Okay? That's how it works. Now, how you do that, depending on who you're talking to, is another good question because different people respond to those things different ways. So you pray really quick and say, Lord, what do I say? How do I do this? One of the things I'll often say is, you know what the Bible says about that? It's just a good lead-in question because almost everybody always wants to know what the Bible says about things. Even absolute pagans want to know what the Bible says about things if they don't know. Or another thing that you can say, you know, I used to feel a lot the same way you felt. You want to know what God did for me. And then you tell them your story. And you tell them about how God forgave you and how you're at peace now with God, despite what you did. You, and you don't have to share them your whole terrible life story, but you can share with them as much as God gives, gives you peace to share with them. And give them the message. And this is where it can get really complicated because you might only so much, you, you might not have fully under, full theological understanding of these things yourself. But you know, what did the guy, what did the blind man know? The blind man know, knew that once I was blind, but now I can. So that's what he knew, so that's what he said. Okay, what do you know? Once I was unforgiven, now I'm forgiven. That's what you know. Tell him that. You don't have to be a theologian. But the more you know, the more you grow to know God as a disciple, the more you can tell him. And that's a good thing. God wants to be at peace with them. And he has designed a way for that to happen. They can be free from the stain of sin. And they can have the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know what? You're like everybody else in the world. Everybody has sinned. But you can be justified or you can be made right with God by his grace, which is a gift. It won't cost you anything through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now you can say you're interested in knowing what the fine print is in this deal. <laughs> What's the, you know, what, what are the terms of the condition? And, you know, those are the kind of things we learn for the rest of our life. God will not count your sin against you if you believe in his son, Jesus. Uh, okay, well, what in the world does that mean? One of the things we Christians do a lot of times, we throw around these Christian statements because we grew up with them, and, pe and we use them like everybody knows what they mean, and people don't know what they mean. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? And that opens up, <laughs> think about the answer to that question. You could write volumes on that question. So what, does God want, what do they need to hear? What does God want you to tell them? You might start with John 3, 16. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, so far? Okay, yeah, let's firm that up. The message God wants you to hear from me today is that your faith in his son Jesus, your trust in his son Jesus, your belief in his son Jesus is the key to your forgiveness. Whatever that means, it's the key to your forgiveness. So, 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Stop leaning unto your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and your understandings and all those things he's going to teach you from this day forward. Any questions? And the guy looks at you and says, are you kidding? I've got enough questions to fill a lifetime. And they should, really. Anybody here not have any questions about God? <laughs> if you don't have any questions, you think you know everything is about God, then you're not asking the right questions. I have enough questions to last a lifetime. And that statement alone illustrates why I cringe at incantational Christianity and easy believism. And it illustrates why discipleship is so important. Lifelong learning. The sanctifying process of spiritual growth in Christ, which is what happens with disciples. Inward regeneration. You might be 80 years old and start to grow inside. Your body is wasting away. Your mind and your heart is being regenerated every day. And you might be asking those questions until you breathe your last breath. Okay? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. A vibrant, growing relationship with your Creator never ends. And let the questions come. How can I trust in somebody I don't really know all that well? Didn't Jesus die 2,000 years ago? What's the connection between Jesus and my forgiveness? What exactly do I have to believe in? Talk to me about faith. What does faith mean? What if I just keep on doing bad things? Does that mean I need more forgiveness? You know, how can I be good? You know how long I've been trying to be good? How can I stop being bad? What if I never stop sinning? How long will it take for me to begin to understand these things and really find peace with God? How long did it take Jesus' disciples? These and hundreds of other questions that need to be worked through, studied, experienced with life is the stuff that discipleship is made out of. And it's why followers of Christ need to be devoted to their callings, devoted to carrying out the third thing, the Great Commission. Disciples of Christ need to be devoted to the Great Commission. I'm going to read it. It's in Matthew 28. I've preached through this many times. The 11 disciples went to Galilee. How come there are only 11? Because Judas had killed himself, right? <laughs> And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some of them still doubted. These guys had walked with Jesus for how many years now? Two and a half years? Yeah. And they still had doubts in their minds. How long is it going to take you? I mean, they sat under Jesus. And Jesus came and said to them, Guys, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And then teach them to observe everything that I have commanded to you. And don't worry, I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. He didn't say don't worry, he said behold. But uh, After a person makes a profession of faith and says, Okay, I'll follow Jesus in essence, become a disciple. They must now be baptized because a sincere expression of faith allows them to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And your water baptism is an outward expression of that inward reality that firms that up in our hearts and minds. And then disciples need to be devoted to the teachings uh, of Christ. Everything, <laughs> he says, Teach them everything that I have commanded you. Teach them, I would argue, everything in my word. How long does it take a person to master the Bible? <laughs> I always, you know, I, I've always heard the phrase, everybody in authority needs to be under authority. I would say everybody who is a disciple needs to be under a disciple and discipling someone else. Pursuing knowledge of God and understanding his teachings is good. 
but the Lord also expects his teaching to be transformative. And as we know more about him, his spirit will empower change of confirmation within us so that we will take on the very nature of God. Thirdly, go through this quickly. Disciples need to be devoted to pursuing and propagating holiness. Devoted to pursuing holiness for ourselves and propagating holiness in others. And I pull, I'm just going to read Galatians 6, 1 and 2. It's short. You might think it an odd portion of scripture for me to use. But it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The reason I picked this, it had that, 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 that striving for holiness for yourself and guarding your own life and striving for holiness on behalf of others too. Restoring them. Our transgressions or our sins violate God's nature and it violates his image. And disciples discipline or correct their disciples, restoring them back to Christ-likeness. So many times we just want to kick people out of the church because we feel uncomfortable around them. And sometimes people who are unrepentant must be kicked out of the church. But the idea isn't to destroy them. It's to set up an environment in their lives so that they will want to be restored to Christ. Sin violates holiness. Followers of Jesus are devoted to restoring others to holiness. But then also the warning is, Keep watch over yourself too, lest you be tempted. And this can only be done, in fact, you know, this, this calling other people to holiness can really only be done by disciples who are already in the process of pursuing holiness themselves. It's very hard to take criticism from someone who is blatantly and openly hypocritical about their own holiness. Disciples, though, are devoted to sanctification. Fifth, disciples are devoted to a house united. A house united. And when I'm talking about united here, I'm talking about united under God. In 2 Timothy 2.4, Paul says, says to his disciple, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, you entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You know what you see in that verse? You have four stages of discipleship going on there. You have Paul talking to his disciple Timothy, telling his disciples, telling Timothy to talk to his disciples and teach them to talk to their disciples. Okay? That's what you see in the first part of that portion of scripture. Verse three says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Then he says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Devoted disciples ought not be double-minded. They strive to serve the one who enlisted them, the one who called them, who called them. I keep pointing to the cross. I should be pointing to that, okay? Who called us to himself, Jesus did, right? So we need to be devoted to Jesus as our authority. Paul is teaching this young disciple to be single-minded when it comes to service. As a pastor, I serve every person in this congregation, but I serve you by pleasing God on your behalf. When I serve you, it doesn't mean I have to do what everybody tells me to do. My service is to serve you by serving God on your behalf. And that's what fathers have to do in their homes. You know, this is why it drives me crazy when I see kids who are in charge in their homes. Okay? Fathers and mothers stand together as a unit and they work together on behalf of their home, answering to God on behalf of their family. Okay? Kids can't do that. Parents have to do it for their children. Now, the children might not like it. 
And that would be normal. Okay? But you're teaching them how to be a parent someday. Okay? My goodness, if God gave me everything I wanted, you realize what a mess I would be? Good night. And I'm 60 now. I'm still messed up. That's why you need to pray for your pastor. I throw that stuff out so I get more prayer during the week. Okay, last one. Disciples need to be devoted to the church. Disciples need to be devoted to the church. Now let me say that a different way. Because whenever you think about the church, because the church is kind of an inanimate object, you need to be devoted to the body of Christ. Okay? The embodiment of Christ here on earth, you need to be devoted to Christ's body. You need to be devoted to Christ's it's another name for the church. Bride. Devoted to the bride of Christ. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is another thing why, this is another thing why we have to keep to looking at Christ, because all these other people we answer to, they will never be perfectly faithful. If there's one thing you can guarantee about humanity is they will let you down. Even the best of us will let you down, okay? Christ will keep his promises in your life. He will always act in your best interest. He is trustworthy. Verse 24 of our text says, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet with one another as is, the, as is to meet together as is the habit of some but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Discipleship, done the way it ought to be done, builds the church up. It's good for the church. It's good for the body of Christ. It's good for the bride of Christ. For it to be practiced with no thought of the church is a thought that is wrought with conflict. And I say that because we have people who have left our church within the last few years who continue to disciple people in our church. And frankly, if you're one of those people being discipled by them, it irritates me. Because they're not part of the church here. Okay? And they're dangerous, frankly. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care how much they know the Bible. You really need to back off on those relationships. It's conflicted. Because they're actually hurting the church by what they're doing. Because they can't come under the authority of Christ in the church. And that's a problem. If you're confused by that, come and talk to me. Who is the us that is to hold fast to our confession of hope? Well, the us is the church into whom we are stirring love which leads to good works. Who must be devoted to meeting together? The church. Okay, members of the body of Christ. Who are we to encourage? The church, each other. And on that day, which the text says that day, which is a reference to the day of the Lord, who will be spared the wrath of God on that day? The church, okay? Disciples are devoted to the church. Disciples have a great love in their hearts for the beauty of the bride of Christ. It is as though the process of discipleship that Jesus uses to help make his bride holy, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. You know where that comes from? That's Ephesians 5, when it talks about husbands and wives and, a, and the relationship between husbands and wives, but here it's talking about the relationship of the bridegroom Jesus to his bride, the church. <laughs> Discipleship is what happens in a church so the church can be prepared for Christ. For she is the body of Christ himself, one with the Father. Okay, I'm almost done. 
I told you a while ago that I want, really wanted to continue to talk about prayer, so at the end of this message, I just want to ask you a question. When you think about all those things that a disciple needs to be d devoted to, can you think of anything you can be devoted to that I mentioned that without prayer? Can you be devoted to knowing Jesus as Lord without prayer? Can't happen. I mean, it's like saying, can I get to know Cliff? Can I be devoted to Cliff and, not, and, and refuse to talk to him? <laughs> you know? Can you be devoted to the ministry of reconciliation without prayer? Helping people come to know Christ without prayer. Oh, we're so dependent upon prayer. Can you be devoted to the Great Commission without prayer? Bringing Christ to all nations, teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded you to do, knowing what they need to hear and when to hear it. Who are we dependent upon? Can, you, can we be devoted to pursuing holiness without prayer? I tell you, whenever my sinful nature wants to turn me away from God, prayer is always what's in the middle of bringing me back. Always. Prayer is a confession. Prayer is a forgiveness. Prayer is of thanksgiving. Prayer is of, hey, dummy, pay attention to God. Okay? Anybody pray prayers like that? Or is it just me? Hey, dummy. I'm not talking to God, I'm talking to myself. Okay? Can a disciple be devoted to unity in the headship of God without prayer? Staying faithful to him as, as our Lord? And can a disciple be devoted to the church without prayer? <laughs> Probably most of my prayer is wrapped up in being devoted to you. I mean, how do you get along with Christians without prayer? I mean, think about it. I mean, I, do you find Christian, all Christians easy to get along with? <laughs> if you do, talk to me. I'm going to kiss your ring, I think. <laughs> we desperately need Christ in the middle of our own relationships so that we can love each other. It's critical. And I'm telling you what, it's really hard to be angry with someone or even to hate someone when you're praying for them. It's very hard. Stand with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, give us a sense of devotion for you, faithfulness to you in these areas of our lives, Lord, and others where you will lead us as you continue to teach us in all of the ways that you have given us in your word. Lord, I pray for every soul in here. Lord, we all have questions. Help us to keep asking those questions. Help us to keep seeking answers, Lord. And as we follow you, Lord, as we draw close to you, Lord, give us what we can handle. Mature us so we can understand more. And Lord, help us to be ambassadors of you, <laughs> telling others, Lord, how they can find peace with the God who loves them so much. Give us opportunities, Lord, this week, and when they come, help us to see them. Loosen our tongues and help us to be your men, your women speaking on your behalf in this world. Help us to shine, Lord, like the brightest of lights for your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.